nine. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only nine Patreon members away from our next major milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, all Patreon members will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 20% off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, and 10% off their orders to Catoctin Creek Rods. Members will also gain access to our private Facebook group community, weekly and monthly Patreon supporter giveaways, specific members only content, and so much more. Again, we are only nine Patreon supporters away from this next major milestone. Check out the link in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and this is a topic that just won't go away this year. Uh, Since early February, when I got to go down to the Richmond headquarters and talk to uh, Mr. Bernarski and then Odin Kirk recently with an episode that just dropped, and now I have one of the main men that really was at ground zero, if I'm not mistaken, with the whole issue. Um, Steve, he runs the, he's part of the Auburn University uh, School of Fisheries Aquatic Research, if I'm not mistaken. And I really appreciate having you down here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate uh, any opportunity, honestly. Um, you know, uh, we work on all kinds of different things at times, but there are, there are some things that, that really do, uh, transcend. How did you get involved with everything that's going on with this, with this specific issue? So I have been working on, uh, what we call endemic black bass down here in the in the southeastern United States, which are bass that are found only in very specific areas. Um, you know, up in Virginia, you have your largemouth bass, you have your smallmouth bass, you have some spotted bass down in the southwest corner of the state, um, and, and those are the only three that you have. And those are those are common in a lot of parts of the United States. Once you get down to South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama. We start to have a lot of local forms of bass down there. Um, we have red eye bass, multiple species of them. We have shoal bass, which shoal. is the one I work on a lot. Um, we have Alabama bass, which is native to the uh, Mobile Basin, uh, where which is what I'm sitting in right now as I'm doing this show in Alabama, and uh, the Aswanee bass and a few others. And and so I have been working on shoal bass for for about uh, about twelve years now, maybe fifteen. Uh, time does fly. And uh, one of the things that we noticed was a problem for shoal bass was introduced Alabama bass and introduced spotted bass, neither of which are native to where the shoal bass is from. They're only found in the Apalachicola River drainage, hmm. which is the, the Chattahoochee and Flint. Um, together forming the Apalachicola River. So that's the only place they're native to. And so uh, Alabama bass had been introduced into the Chattahoochee back in the 70s. Um, and then spotted bass had been in there even before that, since the 50s. And so we were seeing current patterns, not watching something going on because they, they've been introduced so long ago that the impacts have, were already there. And what we were seeing was, is that a lot of places that would have normally just had either largemouth or shoal bass, which were native to the basin, had a lot of these spotted bass, Alabama bass hybrids in a lot of cases. Um, And so that was my first introduction into, hey, this is a problem kind of a thing. When did it be really become an issue to where it piqued your interest and it really piqued, you know, Auburn University to where this became something that really you pursued heavily? Right. Yeah. So so like I said, it seemed like it was being more and more of a problem in Georgia for these smaller, more range restricted species, which kind of makes sense. Because, I mean, um, you know, if they're if they're not normally found with other species of bass, then they'd be a little more sensitive, you would think. But honestly, in a larger sense, it wasn't really hitting a big um, 
uh, what's the right word? Widespread problem, you know, where where like a lot of people all of a sudden were interested until about 10 or so years ago. Um, one of the things I happen to do is um, I'm a journal editor for, for a, a, a scientific journal. And a good friend of mine up in, in North Carolina sent me this manuscript. Um, and it was about Lake Norman, which is a 30 some thousand acre reservoir just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. And he co-authored this paper with uh, uh, another biologist who I know up there who works for Duke Energy. And Duke Energy is the one that operates that dam. It's, it's a quote unquote Duke Energy Lake. And it was about the rapid decline of largemouth bass and takeover of the lake by Alabama bass. And so that was really a shocking thing. Like I said, we knew that they were in these rivers in streams in in Georgia and South Carolina too was seeing this. Um, but one thing that you don't often have in rivers and streams are long term monitoring databases that the state takes. They just it's more common in reservoirs, if you will. Is it was it this right here? Yeah, this that cover? right there. Yes, sir. Um, and so for the first time, we actually had a data set where the, the same, same electrofishing sites are sampled through time every year in the same way. And, and that is a, a basically a proxy, if you will, for population level changes. And we have that, those data a lot more in reservoirs than we do in rivers. And so mm. for the first time, we, I could look at that and go, not only does this happen, it happens incredibly rapidly and it happens at incredibly wide and large scales. Like I said, I mean, there's one thing about a river, you know, that is, you know, a hundred feet wide. And of course they, they're long, but I mean, they're not a huge body of water. And, and, and of course they, 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 there's a lot of flow up and down, well, down the river and they're very connected, I guess I should say. And so it makes sense that fish get introduced there and they start spreading and all that. But but that's a different story if you're talking about a 35,000 acre body of water where they get introduced and 10 years later, they're the dominant fish. And the fish that was there, the largemouth bass that was the only bass species there is now not not just like depressed, it's almost gone. I mean, it's literally like virtually restricted to just certain areas of the reservoir that are like in the backs of coves or way upstream. The actual reservoir itself is now an Alabama bass reservoir and it happened astonishingly fast. And so that was like in the mid teens, 2000 teens when that went down. And a few years later, so we, you know, like every other profession, we have meetings, you know, we have, we have group meetings and, and all and, and and in our case, we, we have them sometimes they're southeastern meetings, sometimes they're nationwide meetings, but we were at a southeast meeting. Uh, and there's so there's biologists from all across the southeast there. And we went out to lunch and it happened to be Lawrence, my but my buddy from North Carolina and one of his friends from North Carolina and a couple folks from West or from um, South Carolina and and um, someone from Georgia, someone from Tennessee and someone from Virginia. And as, as you know, it happens when you're together, you start talking about problems in your state and everyone's talking about the same problem that, oh my God, you know, we have this reservoir and Alabama bass are taking it. Oh, we have that same problem, you know? And then, and, and Virginia's like, well, we just found them in, in the new river in Clater Lake. And I'm like, what? You know, it's like this eye opening moment. Like this isn't some local issue. This is rapidly becoming a regional issue that could also rapidly become a national issue. And so that is how I kind of got involved in it. Um, you know, I told those guys uh, at that meeting, I'm like, yeah, y'all should get together and, you know, throw your day together and come up with a, a larger manuscript to show that this is a huge problem kind of a thing. And, and uh, you know, one thing led to another. And what ended up happening is, is that I kind of helmed that, that process and they, they graciously shared their data for us to take a broader look of what was going on. And so 
like I said, I kind of, I mean, I kind of came into it as, I guess, the ringleader <laughs> without me really being the ringleader, you know, uh, and which is understandable too. I mean, my job is more thinking about writing scientific publications and stuff like that. And their, their job is more, we got to collect this data so we can, so we have data in order to show something like this, if something horrible happens, you know, so it's, so the profession benefits from everybody that way. It's, it's, it's a more collaborative effort that, you know, the state folks spend a lot of time collecting those data. They don't often have time to sit and think about synthesizing. Um, and if they do, it's more just for their state. They don't often have an opportunity to go use other states as data. It's a little easier for someone like me. And so uh, I know a lot of these guys. I've known, you know, your, your buddy, John Odenkirk. We've known each other for a longer time than either of us would like to admit. And, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, uh, I guess I had some credibility. They, they, they trusted me with their data, which was really fun. And, and we, we really basically tried to put together something that was a synthesis of what's going on and a clarion call for if this isn't happening in your state, watch out. Because 10 years ago, Virginia would have said this was not a problem in their state. And look where we are now. Tennessee is in the same boat. Um, and and the, the problem is, is we don't know where this is going to end. And so I kind of came to it that way. Uh, you know, we had, like I said, we had seen those problems with some of these smaller range endemic bass species down here. But I was still thinking local problem, local problem, not something that would affect a major reservoir fishery. And then they opened the, my eyes up that this is not a local problem. This is not a, a problem just if you're a, a bass species that only lives in one river basin. This is a problem even for some of these species that live across a third of the continent. They can't handle this either. And, uh, you know, so it was it was very eye opening for me to realize that, you know, this problem that, that we had seen in Georgia for so long, you know, 50 years in a lot of cases is no longer confined to the state of Georgia. Um, and that when, when it gets into these states, North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee being the three newest ones, if you will, you can kind of, it's a window into the past of what happened in Georgia 50 years ago before we were really looking. You know, you can see why there are reservoirs in North Georgia that do not have smallmouth bass in them any longer. That all they have is Alabama bass and some largemouth, you know, and and so it, it's been an educational experience for me for sure. I think one thing that'll help a lot of people at home that are listening to this is just to discern the difference between because I, I get this a lot in the comment section of well, what's there between a Alabama or a Coosa or a spot or a Kentucky spot? Is it just the same fish with a different name depending on what region of the country you are? Um, is, is, that, is that correct in their assumption or is there actually a distinguish between a spot and an Alabama? Excellent question. So fish taxonomy or a taxonomy period is a very slow process, if you will. Um, it's a long history of process, but but slow. Uh, in that, I think what it is is that there's not a lot of people that do taxonomy, and there's a unlike mammals, where there's like you know I don't know how many exactly, but a couple thousand species of mammals, you know, in this on this continent, you know, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 30, 35,000 species of fish. Uh, in the world, um, they 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 uh, occupy a huge amount of the vertebrate population. Um, they are extremely diverse, and so if you're a taxonomist and you happen to work on on birds or mammals, there's only so much you're going to do um, because so much of it has already been done. But fish is still a wide open thing, and so there were a couple folks in the 1940s. Um, Bailey and Hubs being their last names that were bass taxonomists. And back then, how they were doing taxonomy is that they just ran, wandered around and literally dipped nets in the different places or used their fishing rods or whatever it was, collected bass, looked at them and said, huh, this is interesting, you know, wrote down what they were, took sample, took uh, um, specimens, 
preserve specimens. Back in the lab, they would count things like lateral line scales and number of spines and, and all that kind of stuff and tried to look at like, well, here's where we found these fish. These all look the same and they're all found in this area here. And then they shift when they look, when we get over to here. Um, and that was how they, that you usually define species was place where they were and, and looks, what they looked like, whether or not it was literal looks or whether it was counting things like fin rays or spines or scales or, or whatever. Well, these guys, basically said that you know the spotted bass is found all over the ohio river basin the the, Miss, the upper or lower mississippi river basin also the mobile basin the gulf slope streams from apalachicola river over into texas um but that the ones in the mobile basin in particular and the mobile river basin since we're your your audience is largely in the dc metro area you're not much, not familiar with the Mobile Basin, nor would you was I until I moved here. But that is basically most of Alabama. The Mobile mm. River is where Mobile, Alabama, is. It, it's it empties into the Gulf. Uh, all the rivers flow into that bay. It covers most of Alabama, a little bit of Georgia, and and a tiny slice of Tennessee. Um, that area there was that was those were considered a subspecies of spotted bass. Hmm. And so they were called Alabama spotted bass and they had the three names, you know, my uh, punctulatus, henshawley. And then you had the Northern spotted bass, which is what everything else was. And that was, you know, um, my crofters, punctulatus, punctulatus. The, set, the third name there is your subspecies name. However, a lot of, uh, I think a lot of people probably didn't think they were really subspecies. Um, and the main reason is, is because Alabama bass get so much bigger than spotted bass do. Um, and they're, they're, they, uh, they get, well, I mean, they've stocked them in California and hello, they're getting yep. 10 and 11 pounders. You know, mm -hmm. if anyone has ever gone to Kentucky or Ohio or, or in Southwest Virginia and fish for places, fished in places like that had spotted bass, you know, that a two pounder is a really nice fish and a three pounder is a wall hanger. I mean, they just don't get that big. Um, and so that's a big indication right there that, Hey, it's something they're not, this, there's something's going on there. Yeah. You know, not to mention their separated geography because the, the Alabama spotted bass was only in the mobile basin and the spotted bass was everywhere, but the mobile basin. And so, you know, you start thinking about how does speciation happen? And of course, one of those ways is separation where you have your, you know, you're separated, you don't mix, then you have an opportunity to branch off and do something different, you know, genetically or whatever. So it wasn't until though, believe it or not, even though those guys back in the forties kind of was thinking, yeah, these things are different and maybe they're at the subspecies level. It wasn't until 2008 that somebody wow. finally formally described the Alabama bass and elevated it from subspecies to its own species. Wow. And so they are different. Uh, I'm happy to say not all species of fish are easy to tell apart. I am happy to say that there are certain ways that you can tell these two apart pretty definitively. It's just not like something you would do in your common situation on in your hand or thinking about it. But for one thing, the lateral line scale count, which is the number of, line, of scales. That, so the lateral line, I should back up. The lateral line is, the, is that, that if you can almost kind of look at it on a lot of bass and see a little, um, almost a dotted line running down the middle of, of the fish, it's close to where like the stripe is on a largemouth bass. If you look real close, those, the reason it looks somewhat like a dotted line is because those scales are actually poured. They have a little hole in them. And the lateral line is, is if, if no one knows what that is, um, or if they don't know what that is, it's a really cool feature of fish. It allows them to detect subtle changes in pressure. And so it's actually how they locate prey or mm -hmm. locate an enemy if they can't see them, like at night or in muddy water. They can still see if you wonder why a bass will still be able to bite a spinnerbait or even a jig when it's 
when it's you know muddy, it's because they're using their lateral line to detect the vibrations yeah. from that lure. And so you can look at the scales and you can count them and they don't overlap at all. And off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you exactly the difference. Um, but it, the, I know one thing, the Alabama bass have more lateral line scales than the spotted bass. Because it's interesting have- to me when I try to get into the head of the people, because generically based on the conversations I've had, it, it was probably a good portion of the issue was people transporting these species to places they weren't allowed. And I, I try to get into the head of people like, why would you do this? And I feel like you see a Lake Lanier, you see a Lake Hartwell, Lake Hartwell hosts Bassmaster Classic, like feels no. like every single year. Right. And you're like, I want that. Yeah. That's exactly is, right. is, is that just, I guess for, for that unique, environment is that a unique circumstance or is that a different genetic grouping that made that possible where you have the fish in those lakes specifically just just looking at those two so yeah they were obviously they were introduced um Mm -hmm. and and um one of the things that that is true of spotted bass as well spotted bass and alabama bass both are very adaptable fish and, and you look at where you can catch the fish, even in their native ranges, you can catch them in a stream that doesn't get over your waist. You can catch them in giant rivers. And, and when you impound those rivers and create big reservoirs, you catch them in there too. They are extremely adaptable fish. They, uh, they don't seem to require very specific spawning habitat. They can spawn in in sand or whatever, like firm substrate, like a largemouth can. They also can spawn on just bare rock. Um, they don't need shallow embayments to spawn in. They can spawn in a steep bank, sp- steep rocky banked river um, or, 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 or reservoir. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that limits largemouth bass recruitment um, in reservoirs is often water level changes. And a lot of bass fishermen will know that, you know, they, they always talk about dropping water levels during the spawn being a bad thing. And it is, you know, it's also a bad thing if they drop, if it drops out in the summer, because the juveniles hang in the very shallow water and, and they can get pulled off the banks where they're easy to be eaten. If the water is dropping, you know, spotted bass and, and I would assume Alabama bass too, they don't have those, they don't have that problem. They're not tied to the shoreline so much. Um, even at small ages, um, I studied smallmouth, largemouth, and spotted bass in reservoirs in Tennessee, and we found really definitive relationships between how the reservoir was operated and success of reproduction in largemouth bass. Hmm. But that same stuff did not apply to spotted bass at all. It seemed like they just ignored it, and I think that's true in general for Alabama bass too. And so that allows them, if you think long term, that allows them to live, to set up shop somewhere and be very successful without some of the constraints that, say, largemouth bass have to face. Um, In a lot of ways, they're like feral hogs. Yeah. Uh, Just that outproduce and just they can just destroy an ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. They are. They appear to be very uh, pelagic. Um, You know, they, they go offshore and chase shad or blueback herring or alewives or whatever it is that your reservoir has. Um, largemouth bass will do that too, to some extent, but not nearly like these other fish will. Um, in that same reservoir I worked on in Tennessee, which was just a little one, uh, actually Lawrence did his master's work there. That's how I met him. He was, hmm. he was working on my project. Um, and I mean, you know, we would catch them in gill nets offshore, like when we were looking for walleye or stripers. We would never get a largemouth bass in those gill nets. We would get spotted bass every single time we would do it. Um, I've, I've caught them out in 90 feet of water, ch- and then they were chasing shad. And these are spotted bass that are only a pound and a quarter. You know, and they're out there in 90 feet of water where you would never see, you know, a 14 inch largemouth bass. Wow. So they're just a very different animal. Um, and, and that's, I'll, I'll tell you, that's one thing I have learned as I start studying some of these lesser known bass species is that we used to have this conception as, as biologists, let alone anglers, that a bass is a bass is a bass. You know, they all are pretty much the same. They look different, but they're all pretty much the same. They operate the same way. Their biology is the same. 
And the more I've studied them, the more I say no. There, there, there's a reason. I tell people this all the time anymore. You know, now I've learned it, so I tell people there's a reason why they're different species. Yeah. You know, it's not just because they look different; they act different. You know, and in some cases, that can make them very successful in new environments. And that's something that we as fisheries professionals don't do anymore: is introduce fish into new environments. You know, uh, that was the practice 50 years ago. I mean, I'm fairly certain the fish that showed up in, in Lake Lanier was probably something that, well, might not have been, but I mean, it's common, you know, heck, I mean, Texas stocked Alabama bass in, in one of their reservoirs out in West Texas. Hmm. And California, of course, has brought them over and, and produced these incredible fisheries. But I mean, a lot of those decisions were made 30, 40 years ago. We don't do that anymore. But now the anglers are doing it for us. And you're seeing you know, the, the, this invasion biology thing is true. I mean, there are certain species that are very good invaders, you know, in that if you put them somewhere, they're probably going to take, you know, you know, and thrive. And that seems to be what the case is there. And so when you talk about Hartwell and you talk about Lanier, you know, I mean, those fish were put in there. Uh, those lakes are all steep, rocky, clear water reservoirs. Non-eutropic non-eutrophic you know um they don't have a lot of plants it, i'm probably none i don't think Lanier has any and i'm fairly certain hartwell doesn't either you know not, they don't have hydrilla or any of that kind of stuff most of their woody debris uh, you know the wood cover that was there when they flooded the reservoir is long gone that's true of most of our reservoirs um you know we don't build new reservoirs anymore in this country and we're not going to uh so all our reservoirs are very old 30 to 50 years minimum, and some of them are a lot older than that. And, you know, when you submerge wood, sooner or later it rots away. And so that's largemouth bass, like all of those things, they like the backwaters, they like the wood, they like the plants, you know. And so we have, we as scientists have known that largemouth bass struggle uh, with the, the current state of a lot of these reservoirs. Not all of them. I mean, the Tennessee River reservoirs are great, and, and some of these other reservoirs are, are, are fine, and Texas reservoirs are fine. But, I mean, a lot of our reservoirs are exactly what you think of when you think of Hartwell or any of the, or any of the Savannah River reservoirs, for that matter, uh, or, or, or Lanier, um, or uh, getting closer to your neck of the woods, Smith Mountain Lake. You know, they're deep. They're clear. They're rocky. They don't have a lot of, they don't have virtually no aquatic vegetation in them. And they have a lot less wood than they used to as it keeps going away, you know? And so, you know, 40 years ago, largemouth bass were living large and living life and life in those reservoirs. Now they struggle a little bit more. They adapt, you know, and, and us as, as managers, we do a lot of, of habitat enhancement that we try to do, planting water willow or other aquatic plants. And we, we put brush piles in there or sometimes trees or whatever. But you know what? If you throw a fish in there that likes no plants, no wood, rocks, deep, and, and you throw them in there, then you can throw all that stuff we're doing for the largemouth bass out the window because you're not going to out... You're not going to outmanage um, evolution, if you will. You know, I mean, we're throwing something in there that loves what is already there. And so it's going to thrive at the expense of the natives. And that's what we're seeing in real time. And this looks like it also be devastating for like the Ozark lakes as well. We, we need to describe those that checks like a thousand boxes there. And so it sounds like it, it's a two frontal thing where you have this species that basically is going to thrive in the lakes of the future. As, as lakes become more clear, less cover, this fish is going to thrive. What, what really tell people at home, like, so it, I know smallmouth definitely based on the conversations I've had, they're the ones that get hit the hardest, but then largemouth are right behind them there. Where do you guys see the largemouth population on like the TVA system of lakes, the, the Alabama lakes in 10 to 15 years as this goes on? So, yeah, you're right. Um, and, and I haven't seen what you and John talked about yet. So obviously I might be, might be stepping on some of his thunder, so to speak, but, but so small bass, like you said, they get hit a different way. Um, we call it the two paths of destruction. If you're a largemouth bass, they appear to basically outcompete you. 
You know, I mean, this is somewhat speculative because no one's done any work on this yet. But you look at the data, you showed that graph earlier from, from uh, Lake Norman, and we have those graphs from all these other reservoirs, Blue Ridge Lake in, in Georgia, um, Lake Norman, we have uh, Hartwell, uh, we have um, uh, Lake Belouz from, from North Carolina, we have uh, Parksville Lake in Tennessee. Here you go. Repeated, repeated pattern of the largemouth bass just plummeting and the Alabama bass just taking over. You know, that is a clear species replacement. We can at least call it that. And probably through com competition in some way, it, it resembles competitive exclusion. And, and the other thing is, is that the final, the final panel of that graph that you threw up there was combined large, combined bass catch rates. And notice it's horizontal. Mm -hmm. That means that they're not additing. It's not like you're getting, oh, you're getting Alabama bass and largemouth bass. How great is that? No, one's replacing the other. Your total catch rates of bass haven't changed at all. So it's not additive. It's actually a replacement. And so that's kind of what we're looking at for largemouth bass is that for whatever reason, and we don't know the pathway, to be honest, um, and that's that's a certainly a field of, of future study that a lot of us would love to get our teeth into as to are they eating them i mean is it literally like straight predation are they out competing them for spawning substrate seems unlikely but is that what's going on are the little alabama bass out competing the little largemouth bass what how is this happening we're not 100 percent sure but when you see repeated patterns like that with the bigger picture data Clearly, there's a replacement going on, and that would be the fate of all these reservoirs down the line that they get put in. When I looked at this data, it, and again, I could be wrong. That's why I have the professional on. It looks like that there's trying to there's there's a baseline trying to be formed with the largemouth on some of these reservoirs about how low it'll actually get compared to smallmouth, where you're looking at basically pure extinction at some point in a reservoir. And Correct. so, people at home listening to this. I, just to make sure you understand this for, and I want you to get into it as well. It, it sounds like it, it really sucks if you're a smallmouth lover. There's a little bit of hope in your largemouth lake that there still will be largemouth there in the future. Right. You know, I, you know, this is something that I haven't had a chance to do yet. I'm hoping maybe I will at some point. But so we, so uh, we're in the native range of Alabama bass right here. We have a reservoir just down the road from Auburn. It's called Lake Martin. It's on the Tallapoosa River. It is big deep, steep, no vegetation, old, so it has very little woody cover, clear as a bell. And so the native species there are Alabama bass and largemouth bass. And where do you find the largemouth bass in that lake? They're in the very backs of coves or they're way up river where it's kind of starts to get muddier, you know, and the rest of the lake is dominated by Alabama bass. That's the if, and then from what I understand from Lawrence, who, who knows Lake Norman, that's a perfect description of what Lake Norman is like now. Hmm. It looks exactly like that. That's the same place as they find largemouth bass. What blows your mind is, is that 20 years ago, it was all largemouth bass. So in 20 years, it went from a pure largemouth bass lake to Lake Martin <laughs> in 20 years. And so that's what you're, that it won't, they won't totally go away. And the reason is, is because there's habitat differences between them. You know, there are places in the corners, if you will, for largemouth bass to still persist in the places that Alabama bass don't like. The backs of coves in woody debris or upriver. You know, they, they're, not, they're not fond of it. They're, they can still find them there, but they don't thrive there. You know, they thrive in the rest of the reservoir that's this big open water, no cover, rocky, steep, you know, um, reservoir where the shoreline doesn't have a lot of bass cover anyway. It's more offshore stuff. And that's where they are. And so, so that's why you see that pattern with largemouth bass where they decline and then they kind of hit that asymptote, if you will. Mm, they only get yes. so low and that's it because they're, they're still living in the corners of the reservoir. Gotcha. Smallmouth bass, much different story because the pathway of effect is much different. There, it's a genetic problem. There, they are hybridizing with them 
and literally hybridizing them out of existence. There is nowhere to hide. And one of the reason is, is probably because smallmouth bass and Alabama bass, at least in reservoirs, like the same stuff. Mm -hmm. Everything I just said about Alabama bass is true of smallmouth bass in a reservoir. They like the deep. They like the rocks. They like the offshore stuff. Um, they spawn in those same kind of areas. And it obviously, they spawn right on top of each other. And it's just what is just so surprising, though, because this is the same stuff that we would see with shoal bass. Um, that's the same stuff we would see in the Apalachicola in, is that you have a lot of hybridization going on. Um, and, and so the smallmouth bass is the same thing. It, it's just like, you can't get away. You there? I'm still here. Okay, cool. I don't think we lost anything. <laughs> no, no. And the hybridization is very interesting because I, I really feel like it comes down. So we have another issue here, which is the, the blue catfish issue on all. It's really affecting the whole Chesapeake Bay watershed. And I've had Joe Love who runs Maryland. I've, I've talked to people in Virginia about it. And, and one thing for that issue is trying to remove as many tons as possible. And, and that that's good and all. But we you can't calculate how many pounds per month you need to do to get rid of it. So. That's not going to happen here, I don't think, where you're going to be able just to remove them out of the system. So it sounds like what can be done? Like what can be done to some of these places that they're already in? Did you get that? Uh, no, I, you, you cut out and then everything cut out. Although oh, it's, not, oh no. it's not booting me. It's not yeah. booting me. It just goes blank. I that know. is better. That is better at least. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, what can actually be done about this then? Because once once an invasive is really in a water system, I mean, I know like John with the with the snakeheads. I mean, we have all those issues up here. What are the options? Because it it sounds like to me, as a guy that's not educated in this, it's supplemental stocking of largemouth or smallmouth populations and habitat restoration for those species. Yeah, is that it? So we, it is really hard to get rid of something you don't like. You know, I mean, and and the the perfect example uh, for people in the southeast in particular is kudzu. You know, if we can't get rid of kudzu, we don't have a chance of getting rid of Alabama bass either. I mean, you know, um, you know as a matter of fact, my wife basically calls the Alabama bass the kudzu fish. You know, and, but she's not wrong. I mean, the, 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 rap, the rapidness that it takes over is very reminiscent of of kudzu. I mean, you know, except that kudzu is doing it right in front of you. And because these are fish and they live in the water, it happens without you ever noticing. But mm. I mean, if you think about when you see a patch of kudzu, you know, oh, look, there's a little bit of kudzu. I mean, by the end of the summer, it's like there's three trees wrapped up in it. And, and two years later, the entire block is covered with it. And that's kind of what it seems like Alabama bass are like that. They're still rapid. So by the time you recognize that you've got a problem, it's already too late, um, probably, as far as getting them out. Um, that's almost impossible. Uh, states have tried to stock smallmouth bass, um, not really much in largemouth bass world yet, although I believe North Carolina is maybe embarking on that. Um, but they've tried. Georgia, who has been dealing with this longer than anybody, has had tried repeatedly to restock smallmouth bass in some of those northern Georgia reservoirs um, where they are native. The very, very upper corner of the state is in the Tennessee River Basin, which means those are native smallmouth bass. And they can't get it just they get no traction. They throw them in, they throw them in, they throw them in. And yeah, you know, they're just not seeing them. It's like that just doesn't. I mean, once that, that reservoir becomes an Alabama bass reservoir, it's an Alabama bass reservoir for some reason. Um, and, and so North Carolina is about to start trying to stock its western reservoirs, which are also in the Tennessee Basin. So they have native smallmouth bass. So we'll see if they fare any better. Um, but so far, the stocking thing does not look like it's working the way we want. Let's just put it that way. Maybe largemouth bass would be better. I don't know. But I'll tell you, you got to stock a heck of a lot of them. I mean... They're, these systems are so big. Um, you know, I mean, you think about just Lake Norman, like I said, was is 33, 35,000 acres, something like that. It's in the low to mid thirties. 
uh, a typical stocking rate for a reservoir is maybe trying to get 10 to 12 fingerlings an acre, mm -hmm. you know, and so you're up in the three, you know, 3,500, 400,000 range of fingerlings that you would have to produce every single year just for that reservoir. And now you multiply that by the 20 or so reservoirs that they're well, in. And that's what I was saying, like supplemental versus like what Texas does. Yeah, I mean, it quickly becomes overwhelming, you know, and and states right now, at least, are not set up for that. I don't think any of them really are. Um, uh, it would require entire new facilities, new new personnel, um, you know, because they stock now. I mean, they stock other things now and they're they're usually at capacity. So to, to all of a sudden say, oh, my God, we've got to restock car reservoir and 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 uh norman and and um trying to think of some of the old fontana for for smallmouth bass and, and and it's like well where is all these fish going to come from are we going to cut back what we're doing already well probably not um and so it's it's a major logistical so with that said then if if stocking really is not the solution is it adjusting the environment? Is it habitat restoration? Or at this point, is it just throwing the towel? There's nothing that can be done. Did I lose you again? Huh. Oh, there you are. Um, so it's, so it, it, if stocking is not the solution, is it environmental restoration of habitat? Or is it basically throwing the towel? If your lake has them, it's over. Just deal with it. Enjoy it while it lasts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right now we don't have the answers. And that's, I'll tell you, the, the scariest thing about all of this is we don't have the answers. You know, uh, right now, I think all the states are concentrated on trying to get it to stop spreading. Like the focus right now is, hey, get the word out. Stop moving these fish around. I don't know what you think you're doing, but what you're actually doing is ruining all the native fisheries that are in the, that are in the river, are already there. Um, and and so that right now is is our biggest um, concern is to stop the madness while we can, and then then we can circle back and try to figure out how can we fix what's already messed up. Um, you know, and but honestly, North Carolina has almost reached the point where they're going to have to start thinking about how to fix what's already messed up, because quite frankly, about three quarters. of Yeah, like three quarters of the fisheries are already like having these issues, which is. Yeah, that's it's pretty sobering to to think about that, honestly. Um, well, that was weird. I don't know where I crapped out. <laughs> Um, yeah, we, we mentioned about the largemouth bass habitat and how important that is as these reservoirs age. And that really is what gives any kind of largemouth bass population a fighting chance. And when you look at reservoirs like Gunnersville and Chimago that do have an abundance of SAV, is that really what's keeping those two lakes from really falling over a cliff? Because you think of like, you know, Gunnersville, that's really in the heart of your area, but yeah. it's still putting out massive weights. Is it because there's so much habitat for largemouth that gives them a fighting chance? More than likely, yes. Um, so the Tennessee River does have Alabama bass in it now. Um, Chickamauga, they're in it. Watts Bar, they're there. They're watching the smallmouth bass fishery in Watts Bar go away while we're talking, literally. Mm. Um, you know, they're in Teleco, uh, and they seem to be, we think that there, there's some at least in downstream of Gunnersville and like Wheeler and Wilson. Um, but Gunnersville never was a spotted bass lake, um, or hasn't been anyway since the hydrilla has been in there, because neither of those two species seem to like grass. And neither do smallmouth bass either. I mean, it's, it's it's no it's no coincidence that they affect each other in that genetic way of hybridization. When you think about as a population, they're always you know the Tennessee River is a great example in that you know uh, the Tennessee River has all three of the bigger of the wider range species native to it, you know, largemouth, smallmouth, and spots. And you look at wh what reservoirs have are known for each one of them. 
And I mean, you know, Gunnersville was always a largemouth bass lake. I mean, yes, there's smallmouth bass in there. Yes, there's spotted bass in there because they're in all of them, but they're not the big player. Um, and Chickamauga, probably the same, although Chickamauga doesn't have near the amount of SAV that Gunnersville does. Um, and so, you know, usually what happens there is that the fish in, in a place like Chickamauga, the fish all find their spots. Like the, mm -hmm. the largemouth bass hang out in the grass. The smallmouth bass hang up in either the river or down near the dam in the clear water. And the Alabama bass, I'm not 100% sure, but they probably kind of do more what a smallmouth bass does. Um, but, you know, we it does seem like the two things that Alabama bass don't seem to like is lots of SAV, lots of submerged aquatic vegetation, or muddy, muddy water. Um, there's a reservoir in, ten in North Carolina. Uh, I think it's High Rock Reservoir. I don't know. Or I don't remember what Lawrence says is above and below it. Um, but there's Alabama bass above it. There's Alabama bass below it. But they still have yet to find an Alabama bass in High Rock. But High Rock apparently has got, you know, a water clarity of like six inches for most of the year. For whatever reason, it's just extremely muddy. And hmm. they don't seem to like that at all. And, and that kind of makes sense because in their native range, in the Mobile Basin, you don't have a lot of mud. Um, they're, they're upland, rocky rivers and streams. And, and, and on the coastal plain of those streams, it's more largemouths than it is, than, than it is Alabama bass. Um, in a similar way, in the Flint River, where they're not native, and of course, they're not pure there either. They're, they're actually a mix of both species, spots and, and, and Alabama bass. But at any rate, they're above Lake Blackshear, which is the one of the only reservoirs on there, and it's super weedy. They're right above Lake Blackshear, and they're below the dam in Lake Black in Flint River. But the, the state, who's Georgia, who samples it every single year, has yet to collect a single spotted bass in there. And the same is true for Seminole, which is at the bottom of the system there. It's where the Chattahoochee and the Flint both come together. Um, and right below the dam in Seminole is the beginning of the Apalachicola River. There are Al Alabama slash spotted bass in the Chattahoochee River, literally from the headwaters of Seminole to Atlanta or, or to, to Helen, Georgia. I mean, they're all through the entire system. That's interesting. There's not a single one of them in Seminole. And then we sample below Jim Woodruff Dam for another project for Alabama shad, which is an anadromous shad like American shad. Interesting. What do we see right below the dam? Spotted bass, quote unquote, spotted bass. I'm sure there's some mix. So, huh. I mean, they don't like plants. It's pretty obvious. I mean, that's so no, interesting. There's no research that shows that. It's just observation. You know, I mean, uh, and again, that's where the, the the fact that reservoirs get sampled all the time helps because you have these trends. These a lot of effort expended there. If they were there in any numbers whatsoever, they'd see them, and they don't see them. And and so there seem to be the only two things that really make that really Alabama bass are not fond of. Well, there's one more thing I want to ask you if they're fond of, and we deal with that here in my neck of the woods, which is the tidal James River, the tidal Potomac, and then the upper bay, which is salinity levels. Mm -hmm. Is there any data on that specifically? Will they do a takeover? I would suggest no, based on just what you talk about with SAV and, and plants and stuff. Right. So uh, I, I touched on, on, on this just a hair about we don't know, and that's scary. So... Here's the thing about, and, and so funny because you never, you never, you think about something at one point in your career and you never think about the ramifications of it later on in your career. But when I started working on shoal bass, for instance, well, now I'll, I'll go before that. When I was working in Tennessee on that reservoir that had all three species of bass in there, and we were working mostly because that on that particular reservoir, smallmouth bass was the least of the species for that reservoir. The, the fishery was largemouth and spotted bass. And so that's what we were working on. And when it came time to like, quote unquote, write this stuff up, you know, you, you always want to look at like when you're trying to put your, your results in context of what's been going on before, you look and see what other folks have done through the years and all that. And there's there's largemouth bass scientific literature back to the dawn of fishery science. I mean, it's one of the first fish people really worked on a lot. Spotted bass, a species that is literally found in about 20 to 25 percent of this entire country. Nothing 
no one has ever worked on that fish. Hmm. And it was like, how do I put any of the context of what we found? I mean, it was almost impossible. I mean, it was really, it was like, wow, we know nothing about this fish. It's a bass. How do we not know anything about it? We know nothing about it. Well, then I started working on shoal bass. Well, that's been studied even. Well, now, currently, thanks to, you know, the generosity of my funders and, and my opportunities, we know more about them than we know about spotted bass. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you, you don't know anything about these fish, right? And and so the truth is, is that Alabama bass, even though they're a major fishery in Alabama, we know how fast they grow. You know, we know roughly what people fish for. And we, we kind of sort of know what kind of habitat they use, but only because from a macro level, like sampling, like you have to go sample these kinds of places to get them versus going to go get largemouth. You know, it's been very little actual like science done on them hmm. and and basic science stuff that that they used to do 50, 60 years ago. Temperature preference, salinity preference, all that stuff where you're putting fish in tanks and you're you're changing the temperature. You're 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 putting different salinities in there to see what their lethal point is and all that kind of stuff. Well, now, we don't do that kind of work much anymore. That was the thing to do a long time ago when no one was working on these fish. So you have all these bass species that we don't know, simple things like what's their lethal temperature? What kind of salinity do they want? You know, what, what's, what's lethal for that, for them? I and mean, how much salinity can they tolerate? How much cold winters can they tolerate? We don't have a clue. And so that gets, that's, it's annoying in a general sense, right? Well, why yeah. do we not know anything about this? Then you start talking about an, an incredible invasive species that is being actively moved in a rapid sense all over the place. Then that doesn't become annoying anymore. It becomes damn frightening, if not terrifying, because I've had people ask me, well, where is it going to end? Well, I don't know. And nobody knows. How far north can these things live? You know, uh, I was on, I had the privilege of being on a uh, really cool smallmouth bass podcast two years ago, I think it's been now. Smalley Talk is it's yep. run by a couple guys in Indiana. Love they got guys. wind of this, you know, early on. And and so we had a, a very pleasant, terrifying conversation for two <laughs> hours. And they were like, of course, so those guys are up there in Indiana. They fist the Susquehanna all the time. And, and they're like, and they're like, Ah, well, what about the Susquehanna? Are they going to get there? And I'm like, do you have a map? Because they're in the James. That's mm -hmm. literally like 200 miles away. I would say they're on their way. Will they be able to live there? I don't have the freaking clue. Can they? What would happen if they? Some idiot throws them in in Lake Erie. I don't know. Maybe they'll just die, or maybe they'll take that place over lock, stock, and barrel. And what kind of a catastrophe? Would that be if you replace what Lake Erie is right now for smallmouth bass fishing and replace it with a bunch of three and four pound Alabama bass? I'm thinking humongous catastrophe. And, and so the fact that we don't know that much about this fish makes it really hard to predict the end game. You know, and that's why we are so focused right now on stopping the spread, getting the word out, stop moving the fish because we don't know. We have no idea. It could could they end up in in the St. Lawrence Seaway where we just had those big bass tournaments going on and all those big small bass were caught? You know, sure, maybe they could. What would happen if they go up there? We don't know. Um, and and that's that's the scariness of all this. The Tennessee guys are petrified right now, you know, because in their case, we, there's no reason to think they can't live there. So the question is, is can we keep them out? You know, what's going to happen if they show up in Watauga or South Holston or Norris or, God forbid, Dale Hollow? Mm -hmm. I mean, what happens to the poor little town of Salina, Tennessee, if Dale Hollow's trophy smallmouth bass fishery gets replaced by three-pound Alabama bass? There's all these guides that do all this work to go take people out to catch six- and eight-pound smallmouth bass. Are they going to get people to go out and catch three-pound Alabama bass? I'm thinking not, you know? And so it's a serious deal. I mean, it, 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 could, it could have major implications, and we don't know how far those implications will go because we don't understand the biology of the fish, so we don't know the limitations.
Yeah, and hopefully some of those some of those questions can get answered in the next couple of years. Uh, whether it's it's you know by by you guys or maybe North Carolina because they're really on the back end of this right now about what temperatures they can deal with. Um, while I have you, mm -hmm. I did want to talk to you about the Sholey bass because you know uh, Mr. Bernardsky of, of Department of Wildlife yep. Resources here in Virginia talked about them. It's a really cool fish, and because I mean they are super niche. A and yeah. Cliff noting this real quick. Is this something where, with so many endangered species of the you know of mammal side, you can you can breed them in captivity to keep that from going extinct? In worst case scenario, is that even possible to breed sholies in captivity to where you can keep that from going extinct? And I'm just thinking worst case scenario. Right. Uh, so they do raise show bass um, okay. some, somewhat. Uh, the state of Georgia does stock some. Uh, for whatever reason, um, the, they, they have been very unsuccessful of late to, re to get them to spawn in the hatcheries, and no one seems to understand why. They have literally stocked shoal bass since the 70s. Um, hmm. On a small scale, uh, this is down on the lower Flint River, actually below uh, um, Lake Blackshear Dam, and, and there's another dam just up, downstream of that, Albany Dam. It's the only two dams on that entire river. Uh, it's actually a really cool river. It's one of the longest undammed reaches of river in this country, uh, about 300 miles. And uh, but below there, they they noticed there were the hydro peaking uh, when they kept turning the dams on and off for electricity generation was seemingly having some effect on their reproduction. So they were supplementing that with the hatchery, and and it was very successful. I mean, they were getting 20, 30, even sometimes 40 percent returns, which means like. Wow. A, of a year class, 40% of them were stocked fish. Um, and so uh, um, so they were able to do this. And now we have all these plans on board for shoal bass about restoring them to the Chattahoochee Basin is really a mess. The Flint is, thank God, still pretty good, even though there are Alabama slash spotted bass in there now. But it's a natural system, and they don't seem to be really hybridizing that badly. But in the Chattahoochee, where there's 14 reservoirs, it, it's a different story altogether. Um, and so now, I mean, a lot of our plans call for restoring shoal bass there, but in order to do that, you have to raise them. And, and now all of a sudden the shoal bass have basically said, no, we don't want to do this anymore. And we don't know why, um, but you can do that kind of a thing. Shoal bass is probably a long way from that. Thanks. Thanks to the fact that the, the Flint river is still there. Good. I'll tell you right now, a lot of these red-eye bass are not nearly in as good a shape. Uh, the mm. bark bass in the chat in the Savannah Basin is in really bad shape. Uh, I was just talking before I got on here to a South Carolina DNR guy who used to be one of my students, you know, and and I mean they're looking at perhaps like only 16% of the range that they used to be in currently has pure Bartram's bass in it. Wow. Um, the Chattahoochee bass, which is a red eye found in the upper Chattahoochee basin. Uh, recent work by George DNR. I mean, there may only be as many as, or as few as six to eight pure populations of that fish left. Um, and, and so there were, 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 there could be some very real conversations <laughs> closer for them. The warrior bass here in Alabama is the same way. It's got uh, in that case, Alabama bass are native, but they're still hybridizing with them in, a, in the disturbed part of their range. And the Black Warrior Basin, a lot of that is in the Birmingham metro area. And so it's been very disturbed. Plus, it was very a high mining area back in the day. And so the only place where there's those fish are mostly in Bankhead National Forest, which, of course, is protected. Um, so there are at least three species of, of red-eye bass that are definitely... I mean, I hate to say Endangered Species Act, but I'm thinking they could easily be on the endangered species list before I retire. <laughs> I mean, the, if us, we can find some way to restore them, uh, all it's going to take is a petition and, and a review. And it's going to be hard to argue that they're not they don't deserve to be on the endangered species list. And a lot of that is from hybridization. Steve, yeah, I mean, I know this is such a, a, a dour, a, a dour way to finish up here, but I really can't thank you enough for coming on. I know you're a super busy man. I don't want to take up any more of your time. If if people want to find out more about what you do and and more literature, where where can they find it? 
Um, so I don't actually have a website. Uh, I do have a research gate page where all my um, um, scientific stuff is at. Um, I, I can get you a link for that. And uh, I do actually manage a Facebook page. It's called the American Fisheries Society Black Bass Conservation Committee. And there, it, that is like an outreach thing. Uh, I didn't start it, but I kind of took it over. And, and we have like weekly What's That Bass Wednesdays, where we throw a picture of a bass or multiple bass and say, hey, what do you think this is? And sometimes they're hybrids. Sometimes they're just, you know, one of the species of red eye or a Guadalupe bass or who knows what. Um, but, but we try to give a conservation message. I've been showing an awful lot of pictures of wacky fish from Fontana or from Philpot or from Clater Lake, you know, yeah. and when we give the answers, we explain why these fish are the way they are and where, where is this going kind of thing. So that is certainly a good spot to, uh, to stay up with this in general. I'm, I'm, I use a lot of pictures from a lot of my collaborators in all these states where this is going on uh, to try to, to tr try to preach the message. Cause like I said, right now we're in defense mode. We are, don't spread them any further. God forbid, keep, stop spreading them. You know, um, uh, you know, Kentucky is petrified and so is West Virginia. They're just watching these fish slowly march toward their borders. And, uh, they're, they're currently, both of those states have been doing statewide genetic surveys, looking for them, um, seeing what's coming. And, uh, we're trying to trying to get the word out because I mean we know the anglers are the ones spreading them because uh, they have to be. They know it's not no other way are they getting in there. Um, so we're trying to hopefully make it uh, socially unacceptable to move fish because um, that's the only way we're ever going to get a handle on this. Now, what you guys are doing is great work. And then hopefully at some point we can switch from defensive and we can take the fight to them, so to speak, um, to get this kind of under control. But then, as always, guys, link in the episode description to everything we talked about today. Uh, please give this thing a, a thumbs up. It really helps out in the algorithm. We are the number one fishing show in the greater DM DMV metropolitan area. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.